Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Nice to see everybody here once again this morning. Um, what I'd like to do initially is to really continue a little bit the theme, the beautiful theme that we looked at last Tuesday, just to remind you, in the honor of Tu Bishvat, we looked at some psukim in, in Amos and in Yechezkel and in the Chumash itself, which speaks about uh, the idea that when Kibbutz Galuyot takes place, when Klal Yisrael make their way back to the land of Israel, as we have witnessed in our, in our century, then one of the Simanei Geula, the Gemara in Megillah calls it a Siman Geula, is that the fruits of the land will once again uh, uh, develop and be uh, and prosper. The, the immensity of the, of the harvest of the fruit is, is seen as something which, if you like, I'm just reviewing for one minute what we looked at last week, that uh, fruits of the tree in Israel are not just uh, nice to have and, uh, and, and lovely, uh, beautiful to, to eat and to see and, uh, and to export, um, but they are also much more than that. In some way, they are a sign that the land itself is responding to the presence of Klal Yisrael in the land of Israel. And I showed you the Ramban, I'm just reviewing this for one second. I'm showing the Ramban who quotes the Sifra, who says that one of the brachas, Klal Yisrael were given a bracha, that when they are expelled from the land and sent into Golos, this is the Ramban in Bechukosai, we looked at inside last week, that even though other nations will try and till the land and cultivate the land and make it bloom, they will not succeed. The land will wait. The land will wait, right? Uh, like, like a, uh, like, like if you like a loyal, a loyal wife waiting for her husband to come back from the army or something along those lines. That's the what the medrash says that the land waits for Klal Yisrael uh, to come back, and only then will she blossom and bloom. And what we are seeing today in Israel um, is something uh, quite extraordinary and something very beautiful. Incidentally, the whole idea of, of eating fruits of the tree in halacha and particularly in more mystical Kabbalistic uh, uh, sources um, is, is considered to be fruit, is considered to be food of a very special type. Of course, there's lots of other types of food or wheat and barley and grain and milk and whatever it is, but the fruit of the tree, um, in a sense, is a, uh, 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 is a connection to uh, Gan Eden. The, the only thing that Odom and Chava are reported to be eating in Gan Eden is, is Mipri Ha'etz. And in actual fact, uh, famously, we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Odom and Chava not to eat from the Eitz Hadat, but that wasn't the first thing he said to them. Before God says to Odom and Chava, you should not eat from this tree, right? But he says to them, Mikol eats hagan ochol teichal. He gives them a specific, almost a mitzvat ase, to eat from the fruit of the tree in Gan Eden. So the, the idea of trees giving fruit, which can be picked and eaten without, without having to grind them and make them into flour or making dough or having to cook them or anything like that, that they're immediately accessible and immediately there for our use and that they are what they have to give is exactly what the nutrition that we need, that is seen to be something, an extraordinary type of, of, um, of food. And in that sense, Tu Bishvat, the celebration of the growth of trees is something um, very uh, significant on many different levels. So that's what, so far the revision from last week. I'd like to add to this what is for me probably the most remarkable story of fruit trees in the history of modern Israel, which I'd like to share with you very briefly. Um, after you've heard it from me, you can research it and Google it and, and look, look it up and you'll see some amazing things about it. Let me take you back a little bit. And that is that in the Gemara, repeatedly, one of the uh, primary staple diets of the Jews uh, in, in Israel was uh, dates. Uh, the dates of the palm tree were seen to be, first of all, one of the Shivat Minim, one of the seven species which, which the land of Israel is praised by. In particular, it is seen to be dvash, it's, it's honey. It's something of the greatest sweetness 
and 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 the Gemara speaks also about its medicinal values of, of various different sorts. Anyhow, so we all know that in Israel uh, there is a, a, a large harvest of dates, and indeed Israel is apparently one of the biggest date exporters on the planet. Uh, there is no other country that exports as much dates as Israel does, and we have a massive uh, a date harvest. All this, all this is well known, but something very, very interesting happened, which I'd just like to very briefly tell you. And the story starts, well, the story starts a long time ago, but the story, the modern story starts in the early 1960s. There was an archaeologist called Yigal Yadin. Some of you heard of Yigal Yadin? Yes. Yigal Yadin, the truth is he was originally a Ramat Khal. He was originally a chief of staff. He was one of the military leaders of the country, but he retired as a, a archaeologist and he was one of the top archaeologists in the country. He became famous for the Qumran caves and the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was one of his great archaeological finds and, and discoveries of various sorts. But one of the things he also was well known for was the archaeological dig on Masada. Now, many of you might know about Masada, have heard about Masada. Masada was, of course, a Herodian fortress, which was famous at the time of the Khurban Bayit Shemi. So we're going back to the year 70 of the Common Era, at the time when the Romans destroyed the base of Mikdash. So we know there was a whole group of rebels, Jewish rebels, extremists, who were not willing to accept the Roman rule and fought against the Romans, really a hopeless, a hopeless battle. I mean, they were outnumbered and outgunned by thousands, and, and they had no hope at all, but they fought with absolute fervor and, and zealousness uh, against all logic, against all reason, and eventually they were destroyed. And the their last stand was in Masada, and this is described quite in detail by Josephus. Uh, they went to Masada, thinking that in Masada they were safe because it's so high and before. Anyhow, the Romans pursued them, laid siege to the place, and eventually uh, destroyed uh, that whole, whole uh, uh, the last remnants of the, of the Jewish revolt. However, in Josephus is mentioned that they took with them large supplies of food because they thought they would last out a long time. Okay, you don't know where I'm going with this, but let me tell you, Yigal Yadin in the 1960s, he's doing an archaeological dig of Masada. Incidentally, he finds there the oldest shul, oldest synagogue in the whole of Israel, the oldest mikvaos, the oldest tefillin. He finds the most extraordinary things in Masada. Um, and it's well worth looking at because uh, it, it, it's, it's a remarkable, uh, it was a milestone in, in Israeli uh, archaeology. Anyhow, one of the things he finds was hundreds, maybe thousands of date seeds, you know, the, the, the pit of the date that you see, everyone eats dates, inside the date is a, is a, is a stone, is, is a seed, thousands of these date seeds. Obviously they brought with them a lot of dates, they ate the date and left the seeds. Now the seeds of a date are very, very strong and, and lasting. And even though when he found them, they had been there for close to 2000 years, they'd been lying there in the heat of, of, of Masada, right? They had dehydrated, but um, there's a, 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 a woman scientist uh, called uh, Elaine Soloway, I think her name is, and she is the Hadassah, in Hadassah Hospital, in charge of research into natural medicines. And she was always interested that the Judean date was seen to have certain medicinal properties and to be a special date different to all the dates that we are familiar with. The dates that we are familiar with are, are called Majul or something like that, Majul dates, uh, which originally from, originate from Morocco. But the Judean date, which was destroyed completely by the Romans, they burnt all the forests, they, all the plantations, was all completely destroyed 2000 years ago. The only remnants of the Judean dates were these date stones, which were in found by uh, Yigal Yadin. Anyhow, he found them and they were lying in a drawer in an archeological department somewhere in Barilan for about 40 years. In about the year 2000, this uh, woman a scientist decides, let's try and, and uh, sprout these seeds. Let's try and get these seeds uh, to grow and maybe we can grow a, a Judean date. Maybe we can grow a type of a date which has not been seen for 2,000 years. To cut a long story short, in the south of Israel, in, in the Arava, near to Elat, uh, there is a, something called the Arava Institute, 
which deals with sort of agri agriculture under, under desert conditions. And there she gave these seeds uh, to a, another woman scientist, um, Soloway, I think her name was, Elaine Soloway, who runs this department there. Between them, these two women scientists, the woman from Hadassah in Jerusalem and the woman uh, in Arava, between them, they got one of these date seeds to sprout. And from this date seed, they grew a date palm. And they got into the Guinness Book of Records as the oldest seed ever to have been sprouted in history. To take something 2000 years old and to sprout it and from it they they made a tree so the tree grew and they called the tree Musushelach. they called it Musushelach. Musushelach in, in the chumash is the oldest the oldest person to to live he lived 960 a few years anyhow i go upon him so you've got this massive tree however that was all the good news the bad news was so here's something about date palms, which not everybody knows, is that there are male date palms and female date palms. Only the female date palms have fruit. The male date palms have got pollen. So you need like one male date palm for about 50 female date palms. And then his pollen pollinates all the female date palms and they have fruit. But you need the pollen from the male, but you need the female to actually bear the fruit. This this seed that was sprouted turned out to be a male uh, a, a male tree. Okay, so they've got a nice tree, which is which is the, the species of the Judean date two thousand years ago. That's already a big chiddush, but it hasn't yet fulfilled the promise of Amos and Yechezkel and Chazal that the that the land will will burst forth with fruit. Um, uh, which, ha which hasn't been seen uh, for, for a long time. Uncle Bonim, what happened is another archaeological dig found uh, um, date, uh, date stones from 500 years earlier than that. We're talking now about two and a half thousand years ago, roughly the time of the Purim story. It's coming up to Purim soon, right? The Purim story, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back to Israel, right? With Ezra and Nehemiah, they came back to Israel and they brought with them food. And some of the food they brought were dates. Anyhow, from another archeological dig, they found some date. Uh, and again, they went through the whole process and in the Arava Institute, uh, they, they sprouted the seed. And lo and behold, a new seed was born, and that seed was, thank God, right? That seed was a female date palm. So they now had two date palms. <laughs> the story is almost beyond, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm giving you just very briefly, I, mean, I recommend you to, 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 to research it and look it up on Google, on YouTube, whatever it is. It's a most wonderful, I think it's the most wonderful story. And only in 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 uh, in 2020 just last year right Le less than a year ago less than a year ago in the Arabah institute they succeeded in taking the pollen from Musushalach and to pollinate this female uh, um, date palm uh, which they called Hannah they called it Hannah because she hasn't had she hasn't had children for two and a half thousand years you understand so now they wanted to and 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 the, the director said is we planted Hannah on two bishrat he said we planted our Tubishvat because that's a good day to plant a tree. But it's, this is not just a tree. I mean, I think this is just the most humble. First of all, it, it's a combination of science and Tanakh and modern history. It's, a, it's almost like, I would say it's the modern equivalent of Yechezkel's vision of the dry bones coming back to life. If you look at these seeds, they were completely, completely dried out. Dried out isn't the word. Imagine lying in Masada in the heat of Masada for 2,000 years. They were completely desiccated <coughs> and rock. And, and, but they managed, but <coughs> the DNA, it's almost Tchias Hamas. They contained the DNA of the Judean date, which hadn't been eaten for 2,000 years. So they got the male Judean date from one archaeological dig the female Judean date from another archaeological dig. They made the Shidduch in the Arava Institute. And lo and behold, in September 2020, they had their first harvest of just over a hundred dates, 
which look different to the dates. I saw a film of it. They look different to the dates that we have. First of all, they're bigger, they're chunkier, they're a bit lighter, they're a bit more, uh, and, they, and they, they taste like honey. The guy who ate them, the first thing he said was, gosh, this, is, this tastes like honey, which is very interesting because in the Torah, when it speaks about dates, right? It speaks about chito sa'ora gefen te'en of rimon, eret zeit shemen udavash. The Torah uses the word devash to describe dates. When the Torah speaks about eret zavat chalav udvash, it doesn't mean bee honey, it means date honey. And we don't, we didn't know, we've never seen date honey. This fellow said, these dates taste like honey. Now, I haven't had the zechus yet to eat any of them. But uh, we now have, for the first time, Judean dates which have not existed for 2000 years. So when we speak, and I think, I mean, I've given you this pretty quickly, there are lots of very interesting details along the way, how they did it and who did it and why they did it and what they felt about it. But it's the most extraordinary thing that it's possible to take something which appears to be dead and lifeless and with no future at all, right? And to bring it back to life Right, with a little bit of water, a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of care, and it, to nurture it, and to start once again, because once, of course, once you've got one, once you've got one male and one female uh, a date tree, you can you can eventually have a whole plantation of them. You can have a whole you, you from them you can get a whole a whole new harvest, and that's what they're going to do. But I think it's just about if we're looking at the psukim, right, just just let me remind you again now that you've heard this story. Well, you've heard this story. Let me just, uh, excuse you one second. Let me try and get this. Uh, uh. Right, so this is the text we looked at last week, right? And this was the Pasuk. Veshavti es shavut ami Yisrael. I will return uh, the, 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 the Jewish people to Israel. Right? And they will make orchards and eat their fruit. And this for Amos is the, uh, this is Amos chapter 9, the very, very end of the book of Amos. This is a sign of the Gula. And this is, and I showed you this Posuk in Yechezkel as well, right? When he speaks about I swear that I will re repatriate the Jewish people to Israel. For Atem Harei Israel, and he addresses the mountains of Israel. And for Chem Titein Perichem, your branches to give fruit. Ki Kirvu Lovo, their return is near. And I showed you this um, uh, this uh, this Gemara here, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, which says Ein Lechokets Megule Mize. There is no more explicit manifestation of the Kates. Of the Geula than this, than what he says, this Pasuk, this Pasuk that the trees which have been barren for so long will once again have fruit. And that's Rashi. Rashi says here in that Gemara and Sanhedrin, Kishetitain Eretz Yisrael Perihob Ayin Yofa, when the land gives forth fruit in a beautiful way, Oz Yikarib Hakates, Vaein Lechokates Megule Yote. There's nothing more explicit than that. Anyhow, I think that. I think that this story certainly deserves pride of place when we're talking about Tu Bishvat, we're talking about the land blossoming, we're talking about the connection between Shivat Zion and the land itself. I think that if Chazal referred to this as the Kate Megule, meaning the most, most explicit and, and um, verifiable, if you like, uh, simon of the Geula, uh, this is certainly, uh, this story must be really a, 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 um, a five-star uh, story of, of uh, trees uh, blossoming, which trees that we've given all hope, given up all hope of them. And in fact, this, this woman, uh, the, the head of the director of the uh, research in Hadassah, she says it's quite possible that there are medicinal uh, properties uh, to these dates which are unique to this particular strain of, of, of dates. And, and, and that's what they're researching at the moment. But the harvest only came in a few months ago, September 2020. They harvested these dates for the first time ever. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a, a truly, I hope you've enjoyed this little story and I've given you homework to research it. 
it, I don't know why, I, I didn't see it on the news because the news is too busy dealing probably with, uh, with, with COVID and dealing with uh, political parties and all sorts of uh, political nonsense and, uh, and sword fighting, political fencing. But it's a pity because I consider this to be a beautiful news item uh, about uh, the, the Israel the, the, that we are living in and, and uh, a beautiful Siman Geula. And maybe one day we'll go to the, uh, we will go to the supermarket and they'll say, these are Medjool dates and these are what they call Judean dates. These are dates from the Midbar Yehuda. These dates are grown in the Midbar Yehuda. That's where they grow, right? And uh, uh, particularly in, in the Tanakh, uh, Yericho, is, is, is referred to as the Ir HaTamorim, is the city of dates it's referred to. So there was obviously a center of date plantations around the city of Yericho, which was destroyed completely, all destroyed by the Romans in order to destroy the economy of the country. They left the scorched earth uh, policy after they, after they conquered uh, Judea. But uh, Baruch Hashem, we, we are seeing this but when I saw pictures of these unbelievably desiccated, dehydrated seeds sprouting again, I must say I got a bit of a buzz from that. I just saw the most extraordinary uh, um, uh, phenomenon uh, in, in, in Israel, something which is very, I think, symbolic and significant about uh, uh, the, the people of Israel. And, and, and it's also a simon, I think, for individuals. You sometimes meet somebody who is so distant from Judaism, so distant from anything Jewish or anything spiritual, any connection to Judaism, and is completely uh, spiritually dehydrated and spiritually de and spiritually completely, uh, you, you think has got no future, no life at all. But even such a person with a little bit of care, a little bit of hydration, a little bit of uh, sunshine can sprout, can sprout again. In other words, when I saw these seeds, you think, should never give up hope on anything which you think is, is beyond uh, beyond life. It's not. It's it's it, it can be brought back to life again under the under the uh, um, under the right circumstances. Okay, that's my uh, small uh, addition to our shear of last week um, regarding the, uh, the fruit of the tree, and I'd like to now uh, progress uh, and and look at. Um, uh, what is really the topic of these shiurim, which are themes in Sefer Bracious. You'll have to excuse me for one minute to try and get the right text. I'm... Uh... Okay, just one moment. Right. Second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the name of this Shia is Stars, Sand, and Dust. Has anybody any idea what Stars, Sand, and Dust could mean in terms of a Shia about themes in Sefer Bereshis? Anybody, any ideas? I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open the to... The bracha to Avraham Havinu from Hashem. Yes, yes. Stars, Sand, and Dust are the way in which when God gives promises to Avram, to Yitzchak, and to Yaakov, each one of them, he promises them that they will have descendants, multiple, multiple descendants, many, many descendants, and uses this metaphor. He, he either refers them is you will either have children ka'afar ha'aretz, like the dust of the earth, or ke'kochve ha'shamayim, stars of the sea, or the phrase is used, like the sand on the beaches. What, what, are these, what are these three things have in common? So on the one hand, what they have in common is simply that they are many, right? The, the, the number of the uncountable nature of the dust of the earth, which is actually a little bit strange. Let me just say, by, let me just by way of introduction here, it can't be that the promise is simply for uh, a, um, a very numerous and, and massive a nation, because the Torah itself, in many cases, makes the point that Klal Yisrael are not the biggest of the nations. Lo me Rubchem, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ki atem ha'ma'at mikol ha'amim. 
Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, you are and you will remain Hamma'at Mikol Hamim. We are, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, a very, very tiny people living in a very, very tiny piece of land in terms of planet Earth, right? Extremely, extremely tiny uh, compared to uh, uh, all, all other nations and all other countries. Uh, the size, the actual physical size, um, is, it seems to be not the issue with Klal Yisrael. Klal Yisrael is measured not by quantity, but by quality. So in a sense, uh, these three items, sand on the seashore and dust of the earth and stars in the sky, it's not just that there'll be many of them. The idea seems to be that in some way these are uh, indestructible. You can't destroy the, the stars in the sky. You can't destroy the sand on the beach and you can't destroy the dust of the earth. It's always gonna be there. That somehow these are sort of features of the world which are irreducible, which, which, which have a certain eternity to them. So let's have a look at a few psukim and let's take it from there. One second, I'll get back to my screen. So let's start with Avraham Avinu. So in the very beginning, Avraham Avinu is promised, this land that you now can see, right? Avram has fulfilled the mitzvah of Lech Lecha. He's arrived in the land of Israel. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him, It will be yours and your offsprings forever. It will always be yours. And then he says, that's the land. The Samti Ezarecha, the Samti, second, the Samti Right? I will make your children like the dust of the earth. Right? Just like one can't count the dust of the earth, you can't count them. In other words, they're not to be quantified. And that's really the reason why, in a sense, is that one doesn't count people. Because you can't quantify the value of a person who is living a life of emuna and a life of, of Yerat Shamayim is not quantifiable, is, is beyond anything that can be measured. It something has a spiritual quality to it. But your children will be un uncountable, uncountable, right? So that's in, in, in Bereshit's chapter 13. What's interesting is in chapter 15, right? Avram, so we're still in Lech Lecha, we're still in Parshas Lech Lecha. Avram Avinu complains. You have not given me any children. And I can see already that Ben Basi, so he's referring to Eliezer, right? Eliezer was his servant, his trusted servant. He will, he will inherit uh, my, my, my estate because here am I all these years later, there's about 30 years have elapsed between chapter 13 and chapter 15. Avram Avinu now is close to 100, right? Um, the, uh, and, uh, uh, and he says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it looks like I'm not going to have any children, right? At which point HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him, all still in Lech Lecha, V'hinei Devar Hashem Elov Leymar, God says to him, Lo Yerosh Choseh. Your, your heir will not be your servant. You will have a child who will, who will inherit uh, your position, right? And then he says, and he takes Avram outside of the tent, seems to be. And he says, look at the heavens and count the stars. If you can count them, but Yom alone, he says to him, "Ko yeh zarech." This is what this, like this, ko means like this will be uh, 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 your children. Um, actually, just as, as an aside here, so what do we see here? That Avram Avinu first gets promised his children will be kafar haaretz, like the dust of the earth, and then later in his life he's still childless. He's then promised his children will be like the stars in the heaven. But just as an aside here, this word koi is interested, interesting here. What does it mean here, the word ko? 
right? So the word Chazal connect this word Koi to the word Koi, which appears in Birkat Kohanim, right? In Birkas Kohanim, when the Torah gives us a, a, a Birkas Kohanim, the mitzvah for the Kohanim to say, Yivrecha Hashem Yishmarecha Yorah Hashem Boan Melecha Bichonecha, the Pesach starts with saying, Tell Aaron, Ko Sevorachu Espenei Yisra. The word Ko, Kaf Hei, is the introductory word to the uh, Pesach. Um, in uh, in Parshas Parsh Noso, right? In Sefer Bamidbar, in Parshas Noso, the Kohenim are given the mitzvah of saying Birkas HaKohenim daily. One of the beautiful features of coming to live in the land of Israel is I get to hear a daily Birkat Kohenim, which you didn't hear in England. But the word Koi actually links the... So Chazal say that the word Koi used in Birkas Kohenim links the bracha to the brachas given to Avram Avinu. In other words, the Kohanim are really transmitting to their generation the brachas that Avram Avinu got from HaKadosh Baruch. Avram Avinu received the initial great brachas from God and was told, Ko Yezarecha, like this, like the stars of the sky. Now here's an interesting question uh, raised by the Orachayim. I'd like to just uh, tell you Right, the Orachayim is one of my favorite commentaries on the Chumash, and we've mentioned him once or twice before, but he's, he's, he's somebody worthwhile being familiar with. The Orachayim was someone called Rabbi Chaim ben Attar, who lived in Morocco. And he lived in Morocco in the 1700s, right? And he was a great uh, halachic uh, leader and a great Kabbalist and one of the most significant leaders of Jewish life in Morocco. Incidentally, Morocco uh, was really the Torah center of North Africa. There were lots of Jews living in, in, in Yemen and in Tunisia and in Algeria and the whole of North Africa, but Morocco was, for, for various reasons, became the Torah center of the, uh, uh, of, of the Jewish people uh, for many, many centuries. And uh, um, there was, there's even a tradition in North Africa that the Jews originally came there after the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, right? So they came, in other words, that community dates back even, even before the co Jewish communities in Europe started. The communities, for example, out just, just off Tunisia, there's a little island called Jerba. And the Jerba community date their ancestry back to people who came there by boat after the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, so we're talking about thousands of years ago. Anyhow, but the Torah center for some reason ended up in Morocco, and the Reb Chaim Ben Attar, the Orachayim, was the uh, um, uh, uh, one of the leaders in the 1700s, and he made Aliyah. He came to Yerushalayim in the 17, which was no mean feat to come. Seven, I forgot exactly the date: 1740, 1750, something like that. He came to the land of Israel. Uh, that was an enormously difficult journey to make. Ended up in Yerushalayim, in the old city of Yerushalayim, and he opened a shul and a Beis HaMedrash, and he started teaching Torah in the old city of Yerushalayim in the 18th century, which was all... Uh, and to this day, there's a, there's a street called uh, uh, Rechov Orachayim, and there's a little shul called Orachayim Shul, in, which is... Uh, anyway, he wrote a commentary on the Torah, which is very fascinating, um, and indeed, uh, he, he's buried here in Harazesim, and his kever is considered to be a place, people who go to Kivrei Ovas, it's one of the places which is uh, attributed lots of uh, magical uh, and, and mystical uh, uh, significance. Anyhow, that's not my topic for the moment, but I just wanted to read a couple of words about the Orachayim, that we shouldn't learn his Torah without uh, familiarizing ourselves with where this comes from. So he, so he starts off, kosher. Kosher means I've got a problem with these psukim, right? So what's his problem? He says, he says, he says Why is Avram complaining to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in chapter 15 that you haven't given me any children? He's already been promised. And he's been told in chapter 13, 
Vasamti Zarcha Kafara Oretz. Avram already has a promise from God. So what can he get more here? More, so Akash Baruch is going to give him another promise. But he's, he's been promised already. He's already been given a divine promise from Akash Baruch Hu, that he will have a multiple children. To whom you're the father of a great nation. Says the Archaim, Is he doubting the words of God? In other words, it's, it's strange, says the Archaim, to find in chapter 15, that Avram Avinu complains to HaKadosh Baruch and says, hey, Lilo Nosato Zera, you haven't given me any children. Surely the bracha that he, that he heard all those years ago must still be with him. Secondly, he's got a question, what does it mean, O Rohain Li? So he's got an interesting question in the Pasuk. This is typical of the Mephorshim here, that, that uh, um, a close reading of the Pasuk. Look at this Pasuk again. Avram Avinu is saying, Avram, li lo nosato zera. The, 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 so the Orachim is saying that's not really correct Hebrew. It shouldn't be hein li lo nosato zera. It should be hein lo nosato li zera. The li should be after the verb, not before the verb. What's it mean, hein li lo nosato zera? It, 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 it's written in a strange way. So he's got a very beautiful a beautiful interpretation to this, which I'm sure you will uh, uh, also appreciate. So he says, Ochein, I've cut this short incidentally, there are several pages of this commentary, I've just edited it, and you'll have to rely on me that this is a, uh, a reliable uh, uh, um, uh, editing version. Ochein, he says, however, Kavonos HaKosov Hiyazeh HaDerech, let me explain to you what the Kavona here is of Avraham Avinu. And you'll, when you hear it, you'll see it's an extraordinary, extraordinary pasuk. So he says, Shelios shebesuras hazera sha'omalo Hashem oma kafar ha'oretz. He says, because the original promise that he got from HaKadosh Baruch would be that his children will be kafar ha'oretz. In chapter 13, he's promised the very first promise Avram ever gets that he will be the father of a great nation. He's promised that his children will be like the dust of the earth. Says the Arachayim, the Dovo Yodua. And this is well known. Kihanim Sholim La'afar Haaretz, that to compare people to the dust of the earth, Heim Bnei Adam Habzuyim Vabachusim, is a reference to people who are low quality people, the dust of the earth, it's true. It's a, it's a metaphor, it's a sign for the multitude, for, for many of them, but actually the dust of the earth is something what he calls bzuyim ha'pachutim. Ha'pachutim means they are low quality, that the dust, of the, the dust of the earth is not a compliment. To say about a group of people that they will be many like the dust of the earth. She'ein bohem nefesh kedusha. Right? Clearly, people like the dust of the earth are missing a nefesh kedusha. They're missing a spiritual soul. People with a spiritual soul are not referred to as being like the dust of the earth. Maybe I'll just like to, uh, just to, to give a bit of, bit of depth to this, that when, when Adam Horishan is created in Bereshit chapter 2, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I will, I'll create Adam Horishan. What does he do? He takes the Afar Horetz. He takes the dust of the earth and creates the body. And then, and then he inserts a neshama into this body. The human being is a hybrid, is a composite person made up of a body, and a guf and the neshama, which is a far ha'aretz, and a neshama which comes from the Ein Seif, which comes from a Kodesh Baruch, a And therefore, if human beings are, 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 are depicted as being people like the dust of the earth, it seems like there are people who are living a, a physical life and not a spiritual life. And that's what Orachayim here means in the, in the highlighted word, Shein Bohem Nefesh Kedusha, right? The Haim, the Haim Nikroim, Amei Ha'oretz. Chazal call them Am Ha'aretz. Now the word Am Ha'aretz um, is not a compliment in, in the language of Chazal. Um, but what does Amaharetz literally mean? It means people of the earth. 
people of the earth, and, it, and but it's used as a phrase to mean people who are completely focused on the earth, on their material welfare, on their material well-being, their activities are connected to earning and producing material goods, and they are ame ha'aretz, right? They're not rishayim, chas rishayim, but are, the, the concept of an ame ha'aretz is different from a rasha. They're not doing evil, they're not doing they're not doing Averus, they're not bad people, they're just not people who are knowledgeable, not people who are inspired, they're not people with a, a neshama that is really being activated, which is talking to them. And that is Ameha Oretz. So he says, Uvenei Odom Ka'elu, and these sort of people, Lo Yismale Rotsana Tzadikim Bazaar. So he says, someone like Avraham Avinu, and here comes a very interesting line, imagine this, Arachayim is saying, Avram Avinu was promised you will have be the father of a great nation and they will be many like the dust of the earth. Says the Arachayim, Avram Avinu was not happy with that bracha. And basically what he's saying is, I don't want children like the dust of the earth. That's what the Arachayim is saying here. I don't want children like the dust of the earth. Children like the dust of the earth means there are lots of them, but they're not really concerned with spiritual matters. And that's why Avram Avinu says, meaning, that's how he's explaining the Pasuk. We looked at this Pasuk before, right? Why does Avram say here, you haven't given me? So Arachim learns it to mean, meaning, not you haven't given me, it means you haven't given me a promise of children who are like me. What I want are children, li here means like me, similar to me, connected to me, right? The word li always means a, a strong connection. For example, the chassan under a chuppah says, hare at mekudeshet li. The li is the important word in that whole sentence, right? Li means we are now connected. Right? We, we have a deep connection. We are soulmates. Hareat Mekodesh Es Li. Says the Arachai Makadosh, Avram Avinu was saying, Hein Li Lonasata Zera. You haven't given me a promise of children who are like me. You've only told me I'll have a multitude like the dust of the earth. So, so, says the, says the Arachai. Ulozeh Shiva Hashem. And on that, he gets an answer from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him, look at the stars. I'm giving you now a new bracha, that you will have a multiple nation of children who are each one like a star. Right? It's a beautiful thing, that. Maybe this is the origin, I don't know, in the modern world, you speak about someone who is exceptional, that he's a star, Right? idea of, of, be, of being a star, right? Being a star, says the Arachayim HaKadosh, comes from Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu felt that a star is, is somebody who has an enormous amount of, 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 of what to give, of, of influence, of, 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 of uniqueness. Each star is unique, right? Each star has its own place and its own uniqueness. What I want are children who are, each one of them is unique. I don't want the dust of the earth. And I, I can show you, he says, a sefer in Doniel. Doniel speaks about, uh, the book of Doniel is not an easy book to, uh, to learn, but in it, he's got beautiful prophecies, particularly about the Messianic era, about Yibos HaMashiach. And in it, he speaks about umatstike Horabim, those people who are the leaders the spiritual leaders of the community, kekochovim, that they are like stars. Daniel speaks about that every generation has got stars, and they are the matstike horabim, the leaders of the generation, the people who point the generation in the right direction. They are like stars. And look what he says here. data, and only when he heard this was he satisfied. I want to, this is an extraordinary piece of. I don't want you to appreciate the, 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 the extraordinary nature of this parshanut. Arachayim HaKadosh is a bit of chutzpah to say this a little bit, that Avram Avinu was given a promise from God. 
you'll be the he's a childless man in his 70s and Kosh Baruch says, you will be the father of a great nation and this land will be yours. Avram Ravinu, according to Arachim, turns around to Kosh Baruch and says, I'm not happy with the bracha you've given me. I'm not happy. I don't want children like the dust of the earth. I want children like the stars in the sky. That's what I want. I want to have children who are kekochve hashomayim. Right? And that is, I think, a very, very beautiful, a beautiful perush, and it answers the question that he asked, right? He asked the question, why is he, why is he asking for another bracha? He's already been given a bracha. He says, but yes, he was given the bracha, but the nusach of the bracha was not acceptable to Avraham Avinu. He's saying, Lila, I want to have children like me, that each one of them is a unique, each one of them has, has a special a gift uh, to give to mankind and to the world, and that each one of them carries with them a special message, the message of, of being B'nai Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So he gets a bracha that the Klal should be K'kochvei HaShamayim L'Rei. And that's why when it says Ko Yezarecha, in the second bracha, that is the bracha of Birkas Kern. Yivrecha Hashem V'yishmarecha, Yor Hashem Pono Belecha, is, is, is a bracha that Klal should be, each and every one of them, should be K'kochvei uh, um, there's a lot a lot of very interesting material here which I'm not going into particularly um, there is uh, one detail though I want to just look at because the Gemara the Masech Shabbos makes a big issue out of this what does it mean here by Yotze Oso Hachutza can you see here where well, Akadosh Baruch was giving Abram the promise that his children will be like the stars of the earth stars of the sky, he says, Yoto, he took him outside. Outside of what? what? What do we care whether he was inside or outside? Maybe he was already outside. What does it mean? It's a chazal say, Yoto, osa hachutza, means, Rashi already indicated a little bit, he took him outside, Rashi says, out, outside of the mazalot. Outside of the mazalot. The maz- what are the mazalot? The mazalot are used by chazal as a meaning that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has predestined certain things to happen, but derech hateva. In other words, the law, nature will unfold in a particular way, and that is, if you like, controlled by the mazalot, the mazal. However, Yoti Osa HaChutza, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes him outside of the mazalot, and he says, the destiny of the Jewish people will not be controlled by the forces of nature. They will not have the same destiny as other nations have the rise and fall of nations, uh, they will have a different destiny completely. And in fact, the Gemara there ends up by saying, a muzzle li Yisrael. So one can misread that. A muzzle li Yisrael does not... When, I, when the Gemara says, a muzzle li Yisrael, it doesn't mean the Jewish people have got no muzzle. It doesn't mean that. It means exactly the opposite. It means that the Jewish people are not controlled by mazalot. Mazalot means good luck, right? It's always been something that annoyed me, I must tell you, but I can't fight against the practice on the whole of the Jewish people. To say to somebody, Mazel Tov, right, is actually not a proper Jewish blessing. That's not a proper Jewish blessing because Chazal tell us, our life is not regulated by Mazel, by fortune and luck. And that's why one isn't allowed to go and ask fortune tellers to, and to look as an Isotera to go and consult fortune tellers. The reason, says the Rambam, is because the fortune tellers will tell you what your future is according to the Mazalot. But Klal Yisrael are not governed by the Mazalot. The destiny of the Jewish people is not, is, is not a function of the Mazalot, meaning the predestined patterns in the universe. We're not, we're, we're by Yotze Osa HaChutza. You have a look at the Mephorshim on that Pasuk in Lech Lecha in chapter 15. Avram Avinu is taken outside of the system, right? right? And that's why, incidentally, that's one of the reasons why Yitzchak, why Sorrow was, uh, um, from, a, from, a, from a natural point of view, she couldn't have children. She had to have a child that was miraculous because it was important that the child of Yitz, or the child of Avram shouldn't be a product of the forces of nature, because the forces of nature are limited to the mazolas. But the minute Kalal Yisrael are 
taken outside of the Bazalos, then they have a different destiny. Since Purim is coming up in a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks, I think Purim is coming up. Um, so I'll just connect this actually to a very interesting uh, comment made by the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon on, has got a whole beautiful commentary on Megillas Esther. Half of it is Kabbalistic, which I don't really understand too well, but there are a few things that he says there which are very fascinating. He says, why is it that Purim got the name Purim? Where does the word Purim come from? Hippil Pur, Hu Hagoro, right? That when Homon wanted to decide which day he's going to Lahashmid, Laruga, Laabed, Eskola Yudin, which day he was going to engage in the genocide of the Jewish people, he made a lottery system. Who are Goral? He made a sort of a lottery system to decide which day he would come, and it fell on a certain day in Adar. And because of that, we call the Yontov Purim. Why, why, why are we calling the Yontov the name of the, of the system by which Homon used? for his evil purposes, which never came about. What is that? So the Vil Vilna Gaon quotes this Gemara. He says, no, he says, this poor was an astrological device. He was using his astrological knowledge and all his astrological advisors to advise him which day of the whole year the Jewish people are astrologically, in other words, in the mazalot, they're not protected. They are most vulnerable. Which day are they most vulnerable, right? And it came in Adar because, because of the death of Moshe Rabbeinu. A whole, there's a whole cheshben there in the Medrashim, why it was in Adar, why it was that date. But the point of it was to find a day which in, in the course of the predestined pattern of events, this would be a disastrous day for Kalal Yisrael, right? Says the Vilna Gaon, and the point of our simcha on Purim is that we are not subject to the mazalos. He, he quotes this posuk in Lech Lecha. So the posuk says, achutza, Klal Yisrael do not live within the mazalot. They don't live within the system of predestined forces which can be astrologically uh, uh, um, uh, uh, seen. Right? That this is, on the contrary, as, as the Posuk in, in the Megillus Esther says, Vnafochu. Exactly the opposite is true. The day which astrologically we were the most vulnerable and defenseless turned into Orova Simcha Vasasan Vikar. In other words, the point of Purim is this Posuk. Says the Vilna Gaon, that the deep meaning of our Simcha of Purim is that we are not subject to these natural forces and these natural predictions, and that Kalal Yisrael have got a different uh, trajectory, they've got a different destiny, and they're not subject to these forces at all. So the, so, so the idea of, and that's why we call it Purim, right? Because the actual, the essence of the Yonta, the essence of the Simcha, is to celebrate uh, the, in a sense, the indestructibility of Kalal Yisrael, because because of the promise given uh, uh, to Abraham Avinu. Let me just uh, finish up here the last few minutes of the Shia, and let's have a look at the third. So we've seen the Afar Ha'aretz, we've seen the Kerch Shamayim. So here we find in, in Vayera, at the end of the Akedah, the new, the new metaphor is given here, the end of the Akedah. But Yoma, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is saying to Avraham Avinu after he has shown that he was willing to do the Akedah, but Yoma, Hashem, ki azeh, because you have done what you have done here, because you have not withheld your son, ki he gets a new bracha, Avraham Avinu. I will make your descendants like the, like the stars above. That, in other words, this is a re, restatement of the bracha in Lech Lecha. And then he brings a new one. The kachol asher al sfasayom. And they will be like the sand on the uh, shore uh, of, of the sea. Right? And indeed, the the uh, 
Thank you. We haven't got time to look at all the references here. But here's an interesting one. The beginning, the beginning of by Yishlach, when Yaakov is meeting Esav, and he says, Hatzileni no, miyad ochi miyad Esav. He asks the Kodesh please save me from the hostility of Esav, right? Esav is a molek. And, 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 our, and in his tefillah, Yaakov says, Marta, you promised me. Hatev eitiv imach. Vasamti azarcha kechol hayam. That you're... That, uh, your, that, that, that my descendants will be like the sand on the sea. Okay, so this is the Kliyakar. The Kliyakar here on Parshas by Yishlach, right, so the Kliyakar uh, is writing about 400 years ago, and uh, he was a colleague of the Maharal of Prague. So he says here, um, basically he asks, why does he use this metaphor here? Why does Yaakov say, like Chal, but we have found right, this is really a summary of today's Shia, that Klal Yisrael were compared to three different things. Le'afar, like the dust of the earth, Lachol, the sand on the sea, Ulukochovim, and the stars in the sky. Bezehu, and the, so the Kliyaka says, let me explain to you what these three things are. A bit of original parashanotia. Ki bizman hashalom v'hatzlacha, nim shilu l'kechavi, yorum v'nosa v'gova ma'od, u'matztike horabim k'kechavim le'olam v'et. Right? So he says, Klali shall go through different stages of history. Sometimes they are at stages of shalom v'hatzlacha where they are successful and they are at peace and they haven't forgotten their destiny and they haven't forgotten their identity. And then they are kechovim. Then they are kechovim. So indeed, Klai will have the potential to become like the stars of the sky. But he says, Ubisman has shiflut. Shiflut, what's a good translation of shiflut? Shiflut means when they are... Um, lowly. Lowly, lowly, where they are in some way um, uh, sort of uh, crushed. Where they're not functioning properly, right? Where they've lost lost their identity and they've lost their strength, then, then they are shaheim kafar. They are like the dust of the earth. Lodush, lodush means they're trodden on. Klal Yisrael sadly go through periods of Jewish history where all the nations of the world tread on them, right? But here, the what is the bracha? The bracha is like the dust of the earth indeed gets trodden on. And indeed, they are in a lowly position, but the dust itself doesn't get destroyed. It, it's also it's an indestructibility of Am Yisrael. They will be like the dust of the earth, but the dust doesn't disappear. You, you don't, you, after after the dust is trodden on, it's still there, right? So it's very zarecha kafar haaretz v'zeaf tochus yu b'mitzrayim kafar in Mitzrayim, for example, and we've got lots of other examples in history. But the Jewish people in Europe for centuries, they were persecuted and, and blood libels and, and, and crusades and all sorts of uh, pogroms. They are being plowed, so to speak. They're being ridden on and, and tortured. Nevertheless, uh, and nevertheless, they still continue to exist. And then there are periods which are neither amazingly successful. Mamutza means, I suppose here means... Uh, <coughs> average. Average, yes. Average meaning not incredibly successful and also not times of terrible persecution. There's mana mamutza. Then, the was mancha ain't manucha mina oivim. We don't have manucha. Akarishbarucha matzila vayad nimshluka cholzeh. Then the, the metaphor is the sea, seashore, what? Shekol galei hayom, omdim lehatsif es ha'olam. If you stand at the seashore, it looks like all these massive waves could potentially flood the earth. The earth could be flooded by these waves that come crashing in to the earth and cause havoc. Uva hagiyah lachol, but when they arrive at the, at the sand, hey mishbarim. The sand breaks the waves. They can't destroy the sand. In other words, the sand gets beaten regularly, but is immovable. Doesn't 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 lose its strength. Doesn't lose its its nature. Kachi says similarly. 
the nations of the world who rise up against us. Right, David HaMelech in Tehillim Membeis speaks about all the enemies that are attacking him, and he calls them the waves, the Mishparecha, the Galecha, the Gal, right, the, 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 the waves of the ocean, or like they pass over me. Nevertheless, Einon Yecholim, Einon Yecholim Yisrael HaChalosa, Umitam Zer Nimshlu Yisrael Okay, so we have here three very... If we're looking at themes in Sefer Bracious, which is the title of this little series we have at the moment, one of the themes in Sefer Bracious is that Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov repeatedly are promised that they will father a great nation. And, the, and these three metaphors are used as the Kliyaka because there are different periods in history. And even in, in a various period, there are some people who are like a Kochvei HaShemayim, Kochvei HaShemayim, they're like the stars of the earth, Right, the stars of the sky. Sorry, the stars of the sky that our Kodesh Baruch Hu, uh, gives us uh, uh, independence and and strength and confidence and knowledge, and and each one can shine in a unique way and play a unique role. Sometimes, sadly, it's it, it, it's 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 the dust of the earth. And Klal Yisrael suffer through terrible periods of persecution, but they still exist. So there. The marshal is that they are not just indestructible, and the kachol is the, the dynamic, the dynamism, says the kliyaka, between the crashing, crashing waves and the immovable sand is also a beautiful marshal for the for the uh, eternity for, for the netzach Yisrael, the eternity of Klal Yisrael, even even under difficult circumstances, and that's why when Yaakov is meeting Esav. He says, please save me from Esau. You promised us that I will be like a cholayam. That is the, uh, that's the motion. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. So I wanted to share with you the two and a half thousand 